evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, off the Motor City Madmouth, and I am glad to be joined here by a great dream team that I've been working on assembling, and we're going to call this a Twitter trio. Yes, folks, <laughs> you do meet your people on Twitter, and I don't know about the Twitter this and Twitter that, but I know one thing, uh, leading off the Twitter and is Steve Ballesteri, and Steve Ballesteri, the elder statesman, the and the guy that's been here with me the longest. No, we're not talking about the hair, dude. Not talking about the beer. We're just talking about the fact he's got a little bit more seniority there. And Steve, glad to have you back on the Sports Exchange. Yeah, it's great to be back, and uh, I'm looking forward to it tonight. Uh, meet some new friends, and we'll talk about some great stuff. And uh, you know, let's get it on. All right. Well, we're gonna get it on, and uh, as we talked about, is you're gonna let everybody know how they can get a hold of you. Twitter or whatever you want to get it out there early. All right. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Steve B seven S F G. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff, but I'm usually, you can find me on Twitter usually any time of the day. And, uh, you know, my phone goes off all the time between my sports stuff and my military stuff that I write. So, um, you can always get a hold of me. And the man with the headset, his name is Eric Gerson, otherwise known as Flying Fluffy. All right, Eric, the man with the headset, the man with the YouTube channel, the man with a lot. Okay, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, Scott. I appreciate you having me on. This is going to be fun. Like you said, my name is Eric. Nobody's really going to ever know my name, but we'll call me Eric. That's the real name. That's the one my parents gave me. On Twitter, I am at Jawsaholic, so everybody pretty much calls me Jaws. The YouTube channel is Flying Fluffy. It is a Florida Panthers-based and now also Miami Dolphins NFL NHL-based YouTube channel. Been going at it for just about five years. Really excited to add this to the repertoire. And um, I'm looking forward to filling some of this space in between the end of hockey and the beginning of football. So let's go. Yeah, not only are you going to be doing that, we're going to be having you on a lot of non-sports related broadcasts as well. So you're going to be a very busy fella, Mr. Yeah, I appreciate Eric that. Person. <laughs> and last but not least, the man that's in Wisconsin, and that is Joe Peckham. Joe, take it away. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at FF underscore spotlight, short for fantasy football spotlight. Um, I'm a, a writer for the fantasy football astronauts. I like to do analytics. I follow fantasy football, dynasty, campus to Canton, redraft. It's my game. And I'll tell you one thing I got to say about Eric and Joe. Uh, you know, when I need a break from Twitter, interacting with all of my fans and followers out there, and I do get involved with a lot of these people, you guys are my spokespeople, and you guys know how to stir the drink real well. Let me tell you, Steve, <laughs> these guys stir it, and they stir it real well. That's what it's all about, especially hey. on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It's like, what do you call a doctor that finished last in his class? doctor on social media it doesn't matter why they follow you just hit follow that's it, that's it. Well, there you I, go. hey when i was a kid everyone watched monday night football because a they loved howard cosell and b because they hated howard cosell <laughs> exactly <laughs> if i sat there and gave you a howard cosell story i can tell you right now and i don't mind mentioning it i covered a uh, monday night game at the orange bowl long time ago. I tried to get an interview with Cosell. He wouldn't do it for some reason. Him and his toupee didn't want nothing to do with me. So the consolation prize on Monday Night Football was a guy by the name of O.J. Simpson. <laughs> and O.J. was great. I'll tell you, nice. a fighter like me with the hurts and all that business, O.J. was fantastic. He helped me build my confidence back in the day when I was a whole lot younger than I am now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to care about the other stuff that proceeded later on. All I know is O.J., was doing pretty good things for me early in the process. So with that said, we'll go ahead and uh, get ready to roll here. Right, we're going to lead off with Joe, and he, since he's up in the Wisconsin area, a.k.a. NFC Norris, Chris Berman style. <laughs> and the area that Joe goes ahead and uh, covers, we're going to put him in charge of the NFC Norris, as NFC North. And we're going to lead it off with Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love. Okay, 
Joe, take it away. Uh, what are the the sentiments about the Aaron Rodgers drama up there? Because there seems to be a lot of it. Yeah, well, you know, even just even just this afternoon, um, NBC and NFL Network are getting a bunch of lip service from the staff, from the Packers, talking up Jordan Love. You know, in the me meanwhile, Aaron Rodgers being really vocal about his situation. And, and I see this kind of going two ways. Either it's really true or it's all a big game, kind of like it was last year, where they come out really strong. They're directing you guys all somewhere else. And, you know, maybe it's good for Jordan Love to be getting all these reps with the first team and could be good insurance. Okay. Now, Steve, what's your take on that? Yeah, you know, I, I read something this afternoon as well that the Packers um, – you know, it, it seems like CBS was reporting that the Packers are planning for Rodgers to be on the team because they uh, created some salary cap space by, you know, re-signing Robert Tonyan for, what, 2.9 or, – or they converted 2.349 million of his deal into uh, a, a bonus. So th they're saying that the Packers are planning – for Rodgers to be back at this point, it's difficult to know. I mean, it's going to be hard for them to justify to the fan base to get rid of the reigning MVP. You know, even if he doesn't want to be there, I know a lot of people are, are pointing toward Denver right now, but I think it would be, I, I don't know. Um, we really don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Rogers might be digging in his heels and, and forcing them to, to trade him, but I just kind of have the feeling, like he just said, that he's going to be back. I think he's going to be back. Eric, what's your take? Well, I have a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to do is going to throw out a name that nobody is mentioning, and that's Blake Bortles. He's third on the depth chart. And what nobody really wants to talk about is the fact that Jordan Love is not ready. He struggled as soon as they switched from 7-on-7 seven seven to 11-on-11 11 11 today. Five wide receivers skipped the optional practices standing with Rodgers today. Love is not ready. And by week three, week four, if he proves to be not ready and you're looking at a one and three team, Blake Bortles is going to get the ball. I don't think Rodgers is coming back. I think he's a prima donna. Whether or not I agree with him or whether or not I agree with uh, you know, Pack, th this whole thing with they should have told him that they were going to draft him. <laughs> You have a job. You're getting paid. And, you know, I come a little bit old school, and that's fine. And Rodgers is a great player in his own way. He's Hall of Famer. No questions asked. One Super Bowl, a lot of NFC championship losses. I don't think – I think it's going to be a surprise team. I wouldn't want to sit here and predict it. But I don't think he's certainly going to start that season. I think he knows love isn't ready. and. Rodgers just seems like the kind of guy that will put himself first and watch everything else burn down around him just to make a point. Well, let me tell you this. Candy Evelyn is uh, nodding her head right now in disbelief because she hadn't had, had a chance to see Blake Bortles with the Jacksonville Jaguars because we covered the Jacksonville Jaguars the last few years. And he's a game manager. He's certainly a capable guy. He's not, And he's won one more playoff game than a lot of great quarterbacks out there. But you know what, Eric? I think you're right. I think Blake Bortles could very well be the starter if Aaron Rodgers is not there. I definitely am buying that. At, that's number one. Number two, I think the Packers need to take a stance. And, Aaron, if you don't want to play, that's okay because you're not getting paid anyways if you don't. If you want to sit it out for a year and you just want to watch everything on TV, you can go wherever they had the NFL Sunday ticket, take your girlfriend, Beyonce, to a sports bar and watch all these games. No problem. But I think the Packers need to play hardball here. I really do because you don't want to open up Pandora's box for everybody that's not happy to get out. Now, I agree that Jordan Love, and the reason why they drafted Jordan Love, and I think we all know this, is when Aaron Rodgers continued to get hurt, they didn't have a suitable backup anyway. So you had to go ahead and make provisions with the guy anyhow. Now, whether he'd be ready two, three, four years, once upon a time, okay, Aaron Rodgers, you sat behind Brett Favre and you learned. And I don't think Brett had to like it, but you were better because of it. So I know that we're stealing Joe's thunder because he's up in that area. But if I were the Packers, 
I would be playing hardball. Aaron, you want to sit? No problem. You ain't getting paid anyway, so it doesn't matter. Joe, what's your take on that? Well, you know, as a fantasy football manager, like a general manager type thing, I mean, when I'm drafting a dynasty team, I'm always trying to get the most out of the veterans, make sure I'm drafting for the future. I want to get those guys. And also, I mean, I've been seeing a lot of people making plays on Denver players, trying to get those players on their team in the event that he does leave and go there. It could be good. But, I mean, I think from beyond just those players' standpoint, the management might just want – they just want to be planning for the future. They don't want to just play for this year. They want to play for future years. So, you know, Tom Brady's dealt with this forever. They've always been drafting you know, Jacoby Brissett, all sorts of guys behind him. And you know what? He doesn't care, just like Kyle Trask this year. So somebody, a veteran that can hold their ground and just play their game, not make a big deal in the media – That'd be really important, and that'd be what I think the Packers need. And if he did that, I don't, I don't think that there would be this controversy. If he just, you know, didn't say anything and just went to work and tried to get better. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody to give me a brief comment on Jordan Love because we have a lot of ground to cover. Steve started off with Jordan Love. Is he ready and is he capable? They'll be the two questions that each of you guys are that ready and capable. Steve. Well, is, is he ready? I don't know. I, I haven't watched him personally. Uh, I know that uh, Eric mentioned you know, he was missing receivers today. Uh, I'll have to take him at his word for that. I haven't seen it. Is he capable? I think he's more than capable. But is he ready? I don't know. And that's, that's going to be the question the Packers have to ask themselves, honestly. They have to ask themselves, is he going to be ready? And, you know, they obviously they're – they're planning in case he's not, and they brought in Bortles this year. And, you know, um, it's not as an attractive future uh, with uh, as if they had Aaron Rodgers, but, you know, the reality sets in and time waits for nobody. And, you know, uh, all the great ones sooner or later have to hang it up, and Rodgers might be moving on maybe a bit earlier than they planned. Eric? Um capable that's situational is he capable of coming into a bad team and developing like a young quarterback normally would yes is he capable of coming into a team that expects to compete for the super bowl no and their locker room knows it and a couple of things steve when i mentioned the he missed the wide receivers what i meant was that the five starting wide receivers actually sat out the game i sat out practice um, oh, okay. to show solidarity with Rodgers. And, uh, Scott, to your point about uh, he can just sit out, He, if he sits out or retires, he has to write the Packers a $30 million check for his signing bonus. So there's a huge mm-hmm. amount of leverage that the Packers have there. But then, you know, Rodgers may just say, like, you know what? Eh, Jeopardy will pay me back. You know what I mean? And ready, obviously, I think you indicated, Eric, that you didn't think he was ready anyways, right? Okay, the man should, should know more will be Mr. Joe. Go ahead. Re- ready or capable, Joe? I think Jordan Love is ready to play in that offense because of the way that the offense and defense are structured. They've been getting a lot of free agents for the defense. They've been strengthening it over there. They've got Aaron Jones re-signed. They've got A.J. Dillon. They can go through the running game. They've got a good offensive line. I think he could come in and be a capable game manager, and they could be winning games. Okay. Very good. All right. Now we're going to go down I-94, and we're going to Chicago. All right? And we got three quarterbacks to talk about. And we're going to lead off with you this time, Joe. Uh, Justin Fields, taken by Ohio State. I think it was a good pick uh, for the Bears. Then you have Andy Dalton. And, by the way, Nick Foles is still there. You know all full well that all three of them are going to be there by um, opening day. But let's talk about Justin Fields. Joe, take it away and comment about all three of these guys, and then we'll go from there. Talk about stirring the pot. So I was watching uh, this draft very closely, and I lived in Ohio for many years. I watched Ohio State, and people get so hyped up about those quarterbacks, and they get in the NFL, and they're bit bad. I don't know what it is about Ohio State, but the quarterbacks that they put in the NFL are bad, like Achilles Smith or JT Barrett or, um, you know, Dwayne Haskins. All these guys are getting in there, and, and they're bad. And I don't know. They, they play a lot in different regions, but I just have a bad feeling 
I was making bets in with the fantasy football astronauts that he's not going to be a top 12 uh, fantasy quarterback in the next two years. You know, I don't want him. And then like three days later, he was drafted by the Bears, which is my team. And I, I uh, was like taking a stake to the chest. So Andy Dalton was pretty okay, you know, stepping in for the Cowboys last year. He was he could put up some good numbers in uh, the with the Bengals. I think that it's going to be like exactly the Mitch Trubisky situation all over again. You got Ryan Pace. You got the same upper management. <laughs> Move up for a quarterback. They're going to push him in after a few games, and he's a running guy. He, you know, so I, I don't know. I don't. I'm not very interested in bears quarterbacks and i don't think nick Foles is going to be very active unless some major injuries happen right and of course you have andy dalton you know he's a guy that's capable he's a good quarterback but i think that's a situation where you have three guys and i agree with you the ohio state quarterbacks have really never really lit it up and i, and I think the giants made out better because chicago moved up and what about those draft choices that they and the giants ended up getting for that hall as well yeah, Dave Gettleman. There you go. <laughs> All right, Eric, what's your take on the three amigos well, in Chicago? I'm going to lump it in a little bit here. Um, this all, to me, comes down to what Rodgers does. Because if the Bears or the Vikings, remember the Vikings took Mond in the fourth, so they got cousins. But if the Bears or Vikings smell blood, because Love is struggling or Bortles is playing, you're going to hear – you're going to see veteran quarterbacks because those those teams are going to think, hey, we can win this division with mm-hmm. nine, ten wins maybe. But if Rodgers comes back and Green Bay is Green Bay, then I think all bets are off and you don't know what you're going to see. So I think I'll, in terms of – look, the Bears obviously drafted Fields for a reason. Dalton falls capable in their own right. But, you know, I guess you can't say eight and eight anymore because you know, nobody can be 500 anymore with the 17 games. Right. But, you know, if, if everything goes right with Dalton or Foles, you eight, nine wins. And, you know, the NFC in that division, if Green Bay is Green Bay, there's, not, there's nothing doing for you. So I, I think, you know, personally, if I was Chicago, honestly, if, if Rodgers comes back to Green Bay, I just put Fields out there by game three, game four. And if he looks ready in camp, just put him out there because you just you're not winning until he's ready anyway. All right, Steve, what do you think? Well, I, I look at it from the aspect that you don't want to ruin a young quarterback's confidence. You have two veteran quarterbacks there. There's no reason for me, if if I'm the Chicago Bears, to rush Fields in, especially if you have the slightest doubt he's not ready. You know, so I think Andy Dalton will probably be the starter, at least to start the season off. And, you know, we'll see how things go. If by week five or six, Fields is showing he's ready, then maybe they can start easing him in. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't even think about the fact that if Rodgers come, comes back, it's going to be more of a shootout than a game manager can handle. So I think that that is a good point. I, I just have to say, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm out on Justin Fields. I don't, I don't want him on my team. Well, the only thing I'll say about the whole thing is this move here, what was made by the bears to say the general manager and the coach's job is what it was designed to do. Desperation <laughs> one-on-one. And, you know, we've seen that so many times. Okay. That, you know what, didn't get it right with Trubisky. And now we're done. And we backed into the playoffs last year at an early exit so why don't we go out there and just pay a king's ransom to get the kid of, out of Ohio State? And what do you have? A desperate situation. So <laughs> with that said, we'll talk about the third team in the NFC North, and that's the Detroit Lions. And they ship Matt Stafford over to the Rams. I actually hope Matt does well out there. And they get Jared Goff, a guy that Michael Brockers didn't think – was very good, and guess what? Michael Brockers gets to play with him again, and now they're talking about Todd Gurley. So, all right, Fluffy, let, go ahead and give me your tip <laughs> on this one. I like Stafford. <laughs> I liked watching his style. Look, I grew up watching Dan Marino, and while Stafford's not Dan Marino, 
he's just got that he's got that gait about him. You know what I mean? He's got that gunslinger's gait. You're down by two touchdowns with eight minutes left. But Stafford will make something happen. Even if he doesn't bring it back, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, Goff is a good quarterback. He's good in his own right. I, I'm, again, old school. I prefer to see guys come up with their team, stick with their team, retire with their team. I was disappointed to see what happened. But at the same time, it's a business and you, and you got to move on. I still think they're the odd man out um, in this division. Again, unless, you know, the whole Rodgers thing throws everything up into the air. You know what I mean? They could sneak up on people, but my heart, my heart, my heart, man. I, I like watching Safford. That, that's just that's just my take. Steve? Well, as you know, Scott, I, I, I've always been a big Matt Stafford fan, and I was sorry to see him go. I, I know that he's gotten frustrated at times with the Lions, and they haven't really built a great team around him, but – I just think they're going to take a step back. I, I've never been a big Jared Goff fan. Um, I just think, uh, you know, he's a good quarterback. I'm not saying he's a bad quarterback. I just don't think he's going to take you over the hump. And we saw that with the Rams. I mean, the Rams had a, a Super Bowl caliber team. I just thought in that Super Bowl against the Patriots, they, they kind of targeted Goff in that game, I thought. You know, uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably a little biased in this whole situation because of the fact that I like Matthew Stafford. So, you know, I'm looking at it from that aspect. They, they're they not going to replace him as easily as they think. You know, we'll see what's happening. I know that's your team. Those are your boys. I'm, I'm actually wearing almost Detroit colors here tonight. Yeah, and believe it or not, I'm wearing green, and everybody, everybody <laughs> might think it's Green Bay, but it's the first of the Florida Bulls. So, all right, go ahead, Joe. You know, you're in the division. Um, what's your take on this whole thing? You know, you know what I like about this. I liked about this trade is that when you're in a dynasty league, this this trade almost makes sense. You know, you're you're trading a veteran quarterback to a contender. You're trading picks to somebody doing a rebuild. You know, you lost a quarterback. He needs a quarterback. He exchanged the quarterbacks. Right. Uh, I mean, projections for Jared Goff in his first game is like 13 points. That's like a touchdown and just like 150 yards or something. Like, maybe, like that's ridiculous. There's no way that he is going to be that bad. Um, I, I think that they're, you know, they drafted him on Ross A. Brown. Uh, they've got TJ Hawkinson. Um, you know, they're, they're changing some stuff up. Kenny Galladay leaves. Uh, they've got DeAndre Swift. They signed Jamal Williams from the Packers. He knows the division. He knows that de those defenses. Uh, he's good with rut. He's good between the tackles. He can he can uh, catch passes. Um, I think that they're building around that. Um, their defense. I'm not really exactly too sure about that. Goff's really not going to be good in a in a shootout. But I mean, he has thrown like six touchdowns in a single game. So I I, I kind of like Goff there now. And, and I, that stands out to me more than Stafford going to the Rams because that's like a quick fix, like just a couple of years. I mean, Stafford's also been inflated. Your, your views of staff, people's views of Stafford are linked to Calvin Johnson. So yeah, he can come back. He can come back from two touchdowns with eight minutes left because they have Calvin Johnson, who is a hall of fame wide receiver and, you know, can catch like anything, um, throws some, inter, uh, throws a lot of interceptions. Um, they definitely are, changing their look over with the Rams, uh, you know, from those super run heavy Todd Gurley days, Cooper cups coming back off some injuries. Uh, Robert Woods will be kind of okay. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm more excited about that trade for, for the lions. So I, I like golf in Detroit. You know, Joe, you make a lot of good points. So let me expand upon those. If I may, number one, I was actually happy that the lions got a straight uh, trade to be able to get a golf slash snap and move and the fact that brad holmes even got draft choices to take salary off the back as well you know if you have a straight starter for starter trade 
it isn't the worst thing in the world. But people got to understand, Goss only 26 years old, and Stafford has a little wear and tear out of him in his 30s. So yeah, is Goff more of a game manager? Probably a little bit. But I'll tell you what, Goff is on a mission right now that you gave up on me. And anytime a quarterback feels like you gave up on me, I'm looking to prove you wrong. By the same token, okay, you you were reunited uh, with Brad Holmes, who believed in you. And the thing that has to be understood with this whole thing is a Lions coaching staff. You've got Mark Brunel as a quarterback coach. You have a good offensive coordinator, Anthony Lynn. And the Lions have done a good job bolstering that coaching staff. So you can coach a guy like Jared Goff up. Anytime you coach a guy up with a suitable running game, I don't think the trade's that bad. And then you have back to the draft choices. Yes, I'd like to see Matt Stafford do well. I certainly want to make sure he wins at least a playoff game or two to get that monkey off his back. And, he, and you know, 45,000 yards in Detroit. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the best quarterback in Lions history outside of Bobby Lane, the curse of Bobby Lane. So, you know what, well, Joe? I'm kind of with you that I'm cautiously optimistic about this whole thing. I really am. I know it's a, the Lions have a rebuild. They certainly want to have, looking to fortify that running attack a little bit, and they need to up the line. I don't think it's that bad at all. I, for some reason, a straight quarterback swap to me isn't the worst thing that's ever happened. Both guys get fresh starts. So with that said, let's go up I-94 in the Great White North. Okay, we're t and but at least they don't have to play outdoors. Like once upon a time they did in Metropolitan Stadium another lifetime ago. I don't know whether you were alive, Joe, when they had to do it up in Minnesota, Steve and I were. And Eric, I don't know if you were either, but Kirk Cousins is man in the ship for the Vikings. I, I know you talked about uh, they drafted his potential successor. So, Joe, lead off with that. Well, Kellamon's former five star rivals, high school recruit. Um, you know, he's not bad. He, it's a pretty deep quarterback class this year so you know if it was a little bit thinner quarterback class you know people probably would have been talking about him a little bit more so it was kind of lucky for the vikings that he slipped down like that uh kirk cousins was was good in washington he was he was good he put up lots of yards threw a lot of touchdowns um you know got a lot of money you know they put him on a franchise tag like twice um <laughs> send him to the vikings he gets you know, some some big, big wins in the playoffs, like against the Saints, uh, really did well with Stephon Diggs. Um, Justin Jefferson is going to help him out. I mean, he's got Adam Thielen. He's got Justin Jefferson. I mean, I don't think you're going to see Kellen Mond unless there's an injury. There's, there's no way, no way. I mean, he's locked and loaded, and they've got a lot on that offense. Don't forget about Irv Smith. I mean, people, you know, sleeper, tight end, you know, so – Dalvin Cook, there's, there's a lot going on there. The defense needs to be reworked. Um, you know, you got Harrison Smith. You've got some changing going on with their linebackers. But I watch out. Watch out for the Vikings. Eric? Yeah. Um, I can't really expand on what Joe said because he knows his stuff. <laughs> but what I will say is – I've I've liked Cousins from the time I've seen him. He's my type of quarterback. I just I just like that. I like the style that he plays. He just rubs me the right way. To me, I look at that division and I think Vikings are next man up as soon as whatever goes on in Green Bay goes on. Right. Um, and, and and that's even I think even if if Love comes in and does okay. I, I think Vikings are, are next man up in that division. I, I really do, especially longer term because you've got Cousins, and I think it, there won't be any drop-off if and when Mon does eventually have to come in. I, I like what they did there. I think they, they've done it They've done it the right way, in my opinion. Steve? Yeah, uh, I agree. With you. Joe made some great points there. That offense, I think, is, is going to be ver very, very good this year. You know, as somebody who watches a lot of SEC games, uh, I think with Mond, I th you know, he has some unbelievable plays at times. I think he just needs to be more consistent. And that's something the Vikings can work on him with, you know, especially they have cousins. So it's not like, again, it's not like they're, they're asking him to step in on day one. 
I mean, he's going to have time to work on his game, learn the offense there. I think the Vikings are trending up. They have some issues on defense I think they need to fix. But, um, you know, having watched Mon, like I said, uh, it, it, there's a lot of wild plays in his repertoire. But, you know, he, he makes some mistakes out there. And I think it's just a, a consistency thing with him. So I think uh, the Vikings are in good shape moving forward. I mean, the only thing I can really add to it is that Kirk Cousins is the smartest person on the planet. He, he plays under the franchise sack, what, two, three years in a row in Washington, got those one-year contracts, got a boatload of money, goes to Minnesota is, uh, and is cleaning up there with all that guaranteed money. If you got a guy who's that savvy of a businessman getting all that guaranteed money in a league that doesn't have guaranteed contracts and cousins we trust, period, that's all I'm going to add to it. Talk about somebody that could have complained when they got franchise tag. They could have been the Le'Veon Bell. They could have been the Aaron Rodgers complaining on the sidelines. Making, you know, Instead, he just went to work. He played on the franchise tag multiple times. He did a great job, and he got a big contract, and he went and became a playoff contender. He got all that guaranteed money from Minnesota. Forget about what he did in Washington. This guy is smarter than anybody. My goodness, he's telling Dak Prescott, don't worry, play under the one-year tag. Of course, Dak got hurt, but it doesn't matter. Keep playing on those one-year. You can feed your, uh, unlike Latrell Sprewell, who couldn't feed his family all the way out in Minnesota with the Timberwolves, don't worry, Kirk Cousins can go ahead and feed his family with all the cabbage that he's getting paid from Washington as well as Minnesota. So in Cousins, we trust. And now we're going to go down south and go to Eric Gerson's territory, and we're going to lead off with Tua. Is he the guy in Miami? Oh, wow. You have two hours? All right. So <laughs> so Tua comes out this week and talks about how he he didn't really know the playbook all that well last season. And everybody commends him for admitting his faux pas. My opinion is that you played for Nick Saban and you didn't figure out how to prepare enough. He literally said that it kind of caught him by surprise. Now we've got this dual-headed offensive coordinator system going on in Miami. It's a completely new playbook anyway. So whatever he learned last year, kaputs. He's got to do it all over again. So I guess he has an opportunity to rewrite history there. In terms of him on the field, it's interesting for me because I watch him and his delivery looks awkward. The ball comes out of his hand awkward but then it's always in the right spot. So it's like you, you watch the throw come out and you think it's going to, it's, it, it's not going to be anywhere near accurate, but then he does end up accurate. The thing for me, the big thing for Miami's offense is, is last year, especially with Fitzpatrick, they, they worked the tight ends and they, there were a lot of different ways that they worked the tight ends. And, and that came down to changing the play at the line of scrimmage, which is exactly what Tua says he's not comfortable with. I think it has the possibility this season of being absolutely feast or famine because now two years, two playbooks, they've got the tight end talent. But we've got a tough schedule leading off, and if he is not ready to rock and roll, it could get ugly quick. I was upset, disappointed that they put Fitzpatrick off to Washington. I get it. You want to make sure Tua's the guy, but I don't want to – and Jacoby, J Jacoby Percet – if he sees the field, it's it's lights out. I want to know, and I have no, no interest there. Um, I know there's been whispers about the whole Deshaun Watson thing. Yeah, who, who wouldn't want a player of that caliber on the team? But at the same point, with all the drama that's going to bring with that, and he's looking at at least, what, four or six games of a suspension. So you can't bring him in and get rid of Tua and think you're going to make the playoffs. So I think – Really, Deshaun going to end up not playing this year, if you want my personal opinion there. But the last thing about Tua um, is the wide receiver health. All right? They brought in Will Fuller. Devontae Parker has either been, you know, has had injury issues, and then Preston Williams again last year. If those three guys can stay healthy and Tua can do what he did, anything close in Alabama – You've got an 11, 12, 
win team in Miami because the defense is going to be even significantly more improved. The offensive line is going to be, you know, more cohesive now. They've got a good young group there with Skura right in the middle as the veteran. But it all comes down to if Tua can go up to the line of scrimmage and find a mismatch and get them into the right play. They've got the playmakers. They've got the talent around him. So hopefully last year, as they say, he learned his lesson. Well, don't forget Jalen Waddle was drafted as well, so you have to hope and pray that uh, yeah. he's able to blend in with the uh, three people that you're talking about too, Eric. Good points. All right, Steve Ballesteri. Obviously, uh, you know, we were talking about, you, you know, the dynamics of the all-Patriot thing. You know, the Patriots are in the Dolphins division. Give us a Patriots perspective slash Dolphins perspective about well, in his sophomore year. Well, I, I like Tua. I, I liked him in Alabama. And, you know, with, with the kid they just drafted who played with Tua in college. So I, I think Miami is, is going to be very, very tough this year. I, uh, I've been a Tua apologist since he was drafted. So I'm not going to change now just because he's on the Dolphins, which is, uh, you know, a big rival for my team. But uh, I, I like the kid. I do. I, uh, I like their coach. Uh, I, I think that, you know, drafting that kid, I mean, geez, he's just – I thought he was the best wide receiver in the draft. That's just my uh, opinion. But I think Miami's going to be just fine. I think Tua's going to be fine. You know, uh, he, he had some trouble in his rookie season, but a lot of guys do. And he, he admitted he, he wasn't uh, up to the level he should have been. And – I think that just means he's going to work harder this year, especially with B flow as the head coach. So right. I think they're going to be just fine in Miami. All right, Joe, give us a fantasy and the reality perspective about two of Tagovailoa. I think the Dolphins are going to be good this year. I think that two is going to be serviceable. He'll play the whole year. I don't think he's going to be rushing much. And I don't think they're going to be expecting of him much. You know, Brian Flores, I'm pretty sure he comes from uh, the Patriots, Steve. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what they do there is a lot of times when they had a bad quarterback, like if you went back to um, Matt Castle, when they were out, you know, lean on the defense. You've got a quarterback that doesn't make mistakes. That's what they were getting from two at the end of last year. That's what I think is going to happen again next year. Um I'm, I'm not really excited about the Will Fuller signing. Um, Waddle is going to be okay. He's kind of more of a possession receiver. They might even work him in on special teams. Uh, people are really excited about Miles Gaskin, but I think that they're going to be a defensively dominated team. And I don't think that two is going to do great for fantasy. I was really excited about him last year and was really disappointed and then ended up trading him a lot at the end of last year. And not trying to acquire him this year. So I think he'll be serviceable. I think he's going to play. They're going to do well as a team. Um, I'm not looking to acquire him. Yeah, the, the only perspective I can give you on the Tua Tagovailoa situation is, number one, I don't like changing coordinators every year. That, to me, is always a problem where, you know, great quarterbacks get ruined. Any quarterbacks get ruined. You have to learn a new playbook under a new coordinator. And, again, I'll go back to what Eric said. If you get to Jacoby Brissett, the Dolphins are in trouble. So you want to make sure that Tua is as durable as he can be. And it's not like the guy has a history of not having injury. So, you know, you, that's what you have to be conscious of with a guy who's a very mobile quarterback. And remember, he's facing the big boys in the NFL. We're not talking about a bunch of college kids. So I'm going with you, Eric, okay? As, as long as you don't get to Jacoby Percet, nothing against Jacoby Percet, but if he was good enough to be a starter, he would be a starter, okay? So you don't want to get to your backup in Miami, and you better hope and pray that Tua stays healthy. I mean, I, I like Ryan Fitzpatrick, but we always know that he's a quick fix anyways, a temporary clog. But in there, he's with the Washington football team. It gives everybody good money if you're a quarterback. <clears throat> One other thing I wanted to add, when Eric was talking about the throwing mechanics for Tua, I mean, he had this terrible hip injury in college. People thought he was never going to play, you know, worried about him ever walking again. I mean, there are some NFL players that it, it's ended their career, that type of hip injury. So I'm, I'm sure that that could have stuff 
going on with his throwing mechanics. I mean, he might not be able to have the same range of motion that he had when he was in college. Um, I'm, I'm sure that that's why he doesn't want to rush very much or they don't have him running a lot of things like that. So maybe that's what you're seeing when he was playing last year. Yeah, that that's entirely possible. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. I was just amazed because you know watching the highlights, you, the ball comes out, it, it gets there, it gets there just fine. There's no problem with the accuracy, but it it it, it I'm I'm funny that way. It's like, it's not that tight spiral that you that you typically see, but it gets there, and he's like uh, like Scott said, he's not he's not getting picked. You know what I mean? Um, you know, twenty five touchdowns. 10, 12 interceptions, I think that's what, you, what you're looking at. And if he does that, they'll be fine. Like like you guys said, as long as they don't ask him to do too much and he stays healthy. We, the whole – I mean, and that goes for almost any team, but more so for teams that are on that playoff bubble. You know, you could lose one or two guys and, and knock your season for a loop. Well, if you're going to get to unorthodox deliveries, you guys have really left me wide open the fact that Matthew Stafford didn't mind throwing it underhanded and overhanded as long as he got it. So, I mean, come on, you guys. You guys set me up so well for a Stafford sidearm pitch here that my three tag team partners tonight are awesome, but you laid that one out there for me to slam it. So, it's not about style points, okay, getting it there. Just do it. I'm not going to go back to another lifetime ago that I once won a trophy in bowling for most unusual form, because then you guys would be laughing hysterical, and you don't need to edit that out because that really did happen. And then you don't have to edit out the fact that once upon a time I did go bowling with Dennis Rodman, and uh, his free throw shooting was awful, and my form was awful, and I ended up beating him, and he paid for the game anyways, and we still had a lot of fun and a memory for the ages. So it didn't style point. Just get that job done, whether it's sidearm, overhead. Just get the ball, get the yards. But you guys set it up so nicely. <laughs> you really did. So we're going to go ahead and stay uh, in the state of Florida. And then again, that's what Eric uh, has been asked to do tonight. Then we're going to have a little bit of crab action later meaning the Maryland area. We're going to go to Tom Brady, a guy that Steve Ballesteri is all too familiar with. First of all, Steve, talk about Tom Brady winning the Super Bowl. And then what I want you to do is comment on the fact that they brought in Kyle Trask from the University of Florida to be a guy that will uh, have the opportunity to learn under Tom. Well, you know, uh, Brady, uh, he admitted it took a while for the offense uh, and for him to gel. But I thought they played really well down the stretch. You know, he ended up throwing for over 40 touchdowns. It's not too bad for a 42-year-old. Um, you know, having Gronkowski uh, come back out of retirement, I thought was a, a big uh, plus for him. It just gave him that safety blanket he always had with New England. And, you know, regardless of what ESPN says, Brady always welcomed the competition. Every time the Patriots would draft a quarterback, Brady would just say, trot him out and watch me beat him on the field, and he did that with a lot of guys, Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, uh, Matt Castle. There was a slew of guys that were around when, when he he was the fourth quarterback in his rookie year. So, um, but, you know, by drafting Trask, Brady doesn't care. Um, you know, <clears throat> he'll be there for Trask, but Brady's so competitive that when they take the field in training camp, and we've, I've watched this so many years covering the Patriots up in New England, you know, he treats practice like it's game situation. <clears throat> so when, when he hits the field, it's all business. He's zoomed in. And, you know, uh, if that kid wants to learn the way to be an NFL quarterback, watch the way number 12 prepares just to practice every single day. He's the first guy in the facility. He's the last guy out. And that's a, a great place for a young guy to learn. They don't expect, again, they don't expect Trask to play this year. You know, they, they won the Super Bowl last year with Brady. They brought everybody back. So I, I think they're, they're looking to repeat. Okay, Joe. Acquire him. I, he's going to put up great numbers this year. Uh, yeah. well, the body language could say it all, Joe. Yours <laughs> all right. 
right? With that said, okay, we'll let the body language talk, and then we'll let Eric Gerson go ahead and give us his two cents on this whole thing. So being a Dolphin fan, I've never heard of this guy, so you, can you guys <laughs> fill me in? No clue who you guys are talking about. Tom, what? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this guy, this guy. How's his knee, by the way? I, I, I've, been, I've been wondering about that. You know, eventually, you know, as you get on, eventually something's going to catch up and get you. Now, I'm not saying I want that to happen. The guy obviously has found the fountain of youth. Congrats to him. It wouldn't surprise me to see them repeat, you know, um, especially if they don't have to go through Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay and they don't have to worry about Drew Brees in New Orleans and so on and so on. It's almost like the path has been cleared for this guy again. However, just wait. Eventually, one day, one day he will be as old as I or anybody else here, and he'll have to sit down and stop playing. And he'll just have to hang around the house with his supermodel wife. Again, the guy is blessed. And I, yeah, just like Joe, only with words, just shake your head and just say, yeah, man, just, just, just do your thing. Just do your thing. <laughs> well, I mean, who could bring Antonio Brown out of retirement and, you know, <laughs> and make it work? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're retired? Yeah, you still want a couple of, I'm Tom Brady. <laughs> You want to put, you want to win a Super Bowl? Okay, come over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's just Tom, Tom Brady has the ability. He could be a uh, college coach the way he recruits everybody anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. You talk about a great recruiter, uh, number one. Then the ultimate psychologist to get Antonio Brown straight. Now you got two things going for him there. And the only, thing, enough. the only thing that Tom Brady didn't successfully do was by Derek Jeter's home, and that's it. Otherwise, <laughs> there. And the only thing he didn't do was get Tampa Bay, okay, uh, uh, trademark. But other than that, he owns that town, and, and he's so smart that he goes to a place where there's no state income tax. Right, Eric? You know a little bit about that no state income tax deal once upon a time you are here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I when I moved to Maryland, um, I'm self-employed, and I got audited the first three years that I got here. Never been audited in my life as soon as I moved to Maryland. Audit. Audit. And then they hit me the third time just just for fun and giggles. <laughs> well, there you go. How about that, folks? We give you all kinds of insights here between the audits <laughs> and the psychologists, the most unusual forms. Steve, are you getting all this insanity that we're talking about, Tom Brady, TB12? Oh, yeah. I, and I actually uh... – I, I wrote something about the TV 12 clinic for a military site. Um, and part of the deal was, you know, they, they said, well, you can write about us. We'll do the interviews and all this, but you have to go through, you know, what the, what they call body coaching. And it was some of the most painful stuff I've ever experienced in my life. Now, somebody with chronic pain, like, I was, and as you know, uh, I was medically retired from the military. A after 20 years of chronic pain, I went there, and it it worked wonders. But it is some painful stuff that he goes through every day. And when they put you on that table, you know, he talks about body uh, muscle lengthening and all that stuff. It's painful, um, you know, but it works for him. Uh, it keeps working for him. I thought he had a great year last year. And, you know, he's cheating Father Time. As we all know, Father Time always wins in the end. But, uh, you know, for a quarterback of his age to still be playing at that high a level, I think it's amazing. Yeah, it really is. I mean, let's face it, it doesn't matter how long of a contract Tom Brady's going to sign for. He's going to finish his career at Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay, whatever you want to call it. Today. And you know what? Uh, he, he can tell Bruce Arians, if I don't want to show up for your OTAs, I won't show up. And what the heck is Bruce going to do? Uh, <laughs> eat his Wheaties? No, it doesn't matter. But we know Tom will be there anyhow. It doesn't matter. But, hey, but more power to Kyle Trask. He gets to learn from the best. And when you can learn from the best and you have the ability to go out there 
and take it in. You know, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with a quarterback sitting for two or three years if you can conceivably get away with it at all. It's the problem is nowadays they're being paid so much money and there's so much impatience out there. Everybody wants to see him thrown into the fire, but there's no crime in sitting for sure. So with that said, we're going to transition up I-95 here, or at least I don't know whether Maryland's off of I-95. I don't know. I need a geography lesson. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I thought it was just way up there off the shore of someplace. <laughs> Eric Gerson knows it better. And we're going to be talking about Trevor Lawrence out in Jacksonville. And by the way, just for all you folks out there that ought to know, Tim Tebow, tight end, Taysom Hill 2.0, okay, tight end, $920,000 contract, non-guaranteed. That's an interesting situation if I ever saw. So, Mr. Florida or ex-Florida, Gerson, go ahead and take it away. Give us your take on this one. What's everybody talking about? <laughs> Trevor, Trevor Lawrence is – the most highly recruited quarterback since Moses, and nobody's talking about him. Everybody's talking about Tim That's Tebow, Tim <laughs> and Trevor Lawrence is loving it. I guarantee it. Now, he's used to the attention, so I'm sure he can handle it, but what better way to take 80 to 90% of the flashlight of the media off of Trevor and put it on Tebow, who loves it anyway. He's going to soak it up. He knows how to handle it. And and not only does it does it take the pressure off for Lawrence, but it shows Lawrence how to deal with it when it's his time. It's beautiful. It's a masterpiece. That said, he, I don't think he's going to play tight end. I think he'll be an H-back. I think he's capable. He's, I, I, he's going to make the team. I I, I do not believe Meyer brought him in there to cut him. I think he's perfectly capable of making a player to a game that can make a difference for Jacksonville because Jacksonville is a bad team. And you, you, you put him in a short line, you know, short yardage, goal line situations, he'll find a role. The thing of it is, is that, the when when you listen to Lawrence talk about Tebow, that that's all you need to know about whether or not Tebow's going to make the team. I see so much consternation back and forth between people, and yeah, Urban Meyer is running the show, but they, they, they this is Trevor Lawrence's team, and he loves the guy, thinks he's a great guy to have on your team. That's the quote. He's a great. He's a guy you want on your team. To me, that was the final word. Tebow's going to make the roster, and he's going to get five or six touchdowns somehow, some way. Wildcat, run pass option. He's going to make plays for them. Is it going to make him a playoff team? No, but that's not what they're trying to do. So I, I, I like the move, and I think most of Tebow mania controversy is literally just the media going, he's controversial. It's, it, it, it's, like, a, it's like a circular – you know, what do they call that? A circular firing squad. They create it themselves and then complain that somehow it's, it, it, it exists. Okay, Steve, what's your take on this? Uh, I, I saw the pictures of Tebow. He looks absolutely jacked right now. Did yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know see that? <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> Did you talk about uh, – he looks like a tight end now, doesn't he? I mean, he looks jacked. I've always liked him. I, you know, the year that Bill Belichick, I thought Belichick was doing his uh, Tebow a favor by inviting him to training camp a few years ago for the Patriots because, you know, the Patriots offense didn't fit what Tebow did, and then he struggled. But, you know, getting a chance to see him in person up there, covering him during his press conferences, as, as you said, Eric, he handles himself so well. And the, the Boston media isn't, the nicest group of guys. I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, they they uh, they get on him a little bit up there, but he handled everything with class, with dignity. He he never got upset with anything. I just thought, you know, he's a he's a really good kid, and I don't understand why he's a controversial because he never says anything bad. He doesn't do anything bad. He's just a good guy. Uh, he's is he the greatest quarterback? No, by no no means. But he, I, know, I, I think you're right on the on the money there. He he can play H back. He can do some things. He can do that Taysom Hill thing. 
Uh, he'll help the team. And like Eric said, none of the pressure. on Tre Everyone's talking about Tim Tebow looking jacked, and no one's talking about Trevor Lawrence being the top pick in the NFL draft. All right, Joe, what's your take on this? Well, at least from a, from a fantasy standpoint, I mean, I couldn't turn – my head and not hear Trevor Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence. And then I guess it has, it has changed. That's a great point. Um, I, I think that he could be helpful, but it's really that contract is a, a win, win, win. Like I had said, to you Scott on Twitter. I mean, right. it, it gives Tebow an opportunity. If he's bad, no harm to Jacksonville, nothing's guaranteed. And if he's, if he's good and helps their team, well, then that's good for Jacksonville too. So Tebow can win Jacksonville can win and Jacksonville can win, even if it's bad. Um, so those are some things, I mean, so, so Trevor Lawrence, I mean, five-star recruit, number one, five-star recruit in what, 20, 2018 or 2017 in high school gets the number one draft pick overall in the NFL. I mean, this is like a really good talent that people have been identifying for a very long period of time and he's continued to per perform. So, you know, some people knack, give it, you know, knock him down because, he wasn't getting exponentially better every year, even though as a freshman, he was great, um, you know, and he still maintained pretty good. You know, his accuracy went up a little bit. Um, so, so those are some good things there. I, I think trying to get talent on that roster is, you know, that's what, what you got to do. So I think that they could have a lot of shifty motion type stuff with LaVisca Chenault or, or Tebow if he makes the team, you know, um, also moving – uh, ETN around. So you, you can keep Robinson and James Robinson in the backfield. You could be moving ETN to wide receiver. You can be moving Chanel to running back. You could be putting Tebow in like a wildcat or something there. It's basically like urban Myers trying to create a college team in the NFL. And we've definitely seen this fail in the past, like with Nick Saban. Um, but you know, you know, you know, he's got to try and he's trying to make the best of what he can. I mean, Lawrence is going to be good. People are wanting him this year, next year, three years. He's got great hair. <laughs> there it is. All right, there you go. Let me see if I can piecemeal this thing together in a certain way. Number one, Tim Tebow has won a playoff game, which is a whole lot more than a lot of quarterbacks out there haven't done. Item number one. Number two, the dynamics of Tim Tebow playing in Jacksonville once upon a time should have happened way back another lifetime ago. But he decided to get the drink the Rex Ryan Kool-Aid and play with New York. And, you know, I guess when Mark Sanchez is the other quarterback thinking he might have a pipe dream to think he could start there. But Rex Ryan could sell replacement windows if he wanted to, okay? And so Tim to go take the endorsements of New York and play with the Jets. When in retrospect, if Tim Tebow had any sense at all, he should have played in Jackson. Where will he could have played quarterback, okay, when they needed him? And, number, and another thing, okay, he will put rear ends in the stands, okay? You got a local kid, okay, playing in a 1-15 in team, okay, 1-15 in team, so he'll put rear end. I, I got to tell you, a long time ago, I was talking to my good friend Dan Edwards, who was a PR guy up until he got moved into the history place where they put all your uh, PR guys when they're all done and they bring somebody else. And I wrote a story, a column on Tim Tebow, that he should have, if he had any sense at all, he should have accepted a trade to Jacksonville from Denver, and he could have played quarterback for the Jaguars back then. Instead, he goes to New York, and whatever he – he didn't accomplish his objective to be a number one quarterback there. And as Steve alluded to, he wasn't going to get it done in New England because he had – obviously you had – he couldn't even win a backup job there, let alone second or third spot. I think he would have made the roster if they kept three quarterbacks, but they only kept two. So Tim Tebow should have played starting quarterback in Jacksonville a while back, but I guess he's there now with Urban Meyer. And, yes, we could talk about all the gimmickry that we think – Meyer is going to be, why don't we just call it the modern day version of the wishbone for all I care, you know, because if there's a gimmick, Urban Meyer will find it and figure he's only got one way to go and that's off. So, you know, I think the relationship has come full circle anyways, that they only won one game last year. What do you got to lose? Non-guaranteed money. Okay. Item number one. 
And then, of course, we can't forget that Trevor Lawrence, who I think is going to be a fine quarterback. He's won at every level. So I think that if RFK, okay, had, uh, had a good bodyguard in Rosie Greer, then to me, Tim Tebow is a very good bodyguard for Trevor Lawrence to deflect all that stuff out there so he's not getting crucified. You get the analogy, guys? Hey, hey, one other thing. Nobody's talking about Gardner Minshew. I mean, he won their first game last year. Minshew Madness was a thing. He was like a sixth or seventh round pick um, in the NFL draft as a rookie came out. Um, you know, I think that they're going to be – one thing about Tebow is – he could play quarterback, I guess, maybe. It's, but having him at tight end eligibility, they can keep Minshew. If there's some injuries going on in the NFL, uh, he could get shipped off in a trade. Well, let me tell you one thing about Gardner Minshew, Joe. I was actually covering the draft in Jacksonville one year when they drafted him. And a lot of people really thought, you know, a sixth-round pick out of Washington State, you know, with uh, Mike Leach. And many thought that maybe he's a sleeper. I don't want to say Tom Brady, but everybody knows that Tom Brady was not a first round pick. He was picked later in the draft. <laughs> have your franchise quarterback in the first or second round. So they thought highly of Gardner Minshew and they picked him and they thought they had a steal there. I like Gardner Minshew. I think the quarterback dynamics in Jacksonville are very unique because it does work out so many different ways as well. And don't they have Jake Luton there too, I believe? Uh, so you've got him there, I, although I don't know he'll be there a whole lot longer with that room being what it is, but you have a lot of capable arms. So good point, though, Joe. You know, I mean, we don't know where Tim Tebow is going to be, you know, whether he's an emergency quarterback, an H-back, whether he actually can play a little tight end. You know, I guess it's anybody's guess. And as the transcripts come for Jacksonville, you guys are all be getting them anyways to read them. So when you're grilled again well, a few weeks from now, and we'll certainly be able to readdress it again. So, I don't know. I think Tim Tebow has come full circle. I'm glad he is in Jacksonville, finally, okay? What is he going to do in Jacksonville? TBD, okay? And, again, you know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Trevor Lawrence can do. I really am. And, you know, and they've got the running back, Travis Etienne, as well. So, you've got Lawrence and Etienne, the two Clemson kids, together. So, there's familiarity with that offense as well. So, It'll be pretty interesting. So I'm looking forward to seeing Trevor Lawrence. I really, really am. And where the quarterback situation plays itself out, well, I don't know. It'll be interesting to say the least. But, folks, if you don't get anything about what all of us experts are saying, Tim Tebow does have one playoff win more than a whole lot of other quarterbacks out there. Anything else you guys want to add to that? He beat the Steelers in the playoffs. I still remember that game like it was yesterday. <laughs> I'm sure you do. All right, well, now let's go up there where the Crab Cake Country, we're talking about Lamar Jackson. Okay, Eric, roll with it, buddy. All right, so Lamar, I tell you what. Um, the local opinion of the Ravens always surprises me because as a Dolphin fan, we have this, this vision of – the Ravens as this hardcore, hard-nosed, tough team, and they are. But the complaining on local talk radio is, is I, I, I just have to laugh about it because <laughs> they're good and they don't know it. Now, as far as Jackson is concerned, they drafted these two kids, Bateman and Wallace, to help us out side game. The thing with Jackson is that if you're going to be a running quarterback, and you're going to throw on the run, you've got to be accurate. If he's throwing it in the middle of the field, you're good to go. But his outside passes a little bit, you know, they're lacking the accuracy that you desire. So in order for him to take the next step, and the Ravens really to take the next step as a team, he's got to fix the inconsistency in his accuracy. It's maddening. He'll make these great throws, and then the next time he's on the run, it's just, it's just nowhere near the target. And that, that part of his game has got to be fixed. And the other thing about it is J.K. Dobbins. You got to get him, you got to get feed, feed him and take that pressure off of Jackson because, look, running quarterbacks, they all end up with the same career path, right? Somewhere year four or five, you either get that injury, you notice you start to slow down or not run as much. And so he's got to develop a little bit more of. I don't want to say he's got to become a pocket passer, but 
he's got to become a little bit more of, of, a, of a pure quarterback for them to take the next step, unless he's going to fix that accuracy on the run part, because teams are able to key on him a little bit and force him to throw rather, you know, where you've got like a Russell Wilson, you don't know what that dude's going to do. And he can kill you either way. But with Jackson, you kind of, all right, come on, we're, we're going to make you scramble and throw because we're not convinced that you, you can throw that ball outside accurate every time. They're willing to take those chances. Okay, Joe? It's a rough spot for fantasy. I don't see a lot of production coming out of this offense. Um, I see it, I see it being kind of stagnant. I think that, that once the, the film book was out on Lamar Jackson – uh, they started adjusting their coverages um, to force him to stay in the pocket, you know, adjusting the way the defensive line was to contain him more um, to, to, you know, so you're holding him in the pocket more. You're forcing him to make those tight throws. You're not giving him lanes to uh, break outside for rushing. And it was really tough for him. I mean, big fantasy disappointment last year, big NFL disappointment. I mean, MVP the year before, it just, I, I don't know. I'm, I am not convinced that he is going to go back to the success that he had. I don't think that Bateman, I don't think, I don't like Wallace. I, I don't like Dobbins. I, I just don't think that they're really going to be clicking on offense and producing um, even in the top half of the NFL for offensive stats. Steve. Well, I think the, the big thing with him is to get the most out of him. They need him playing on the center more. You know, he was under center the least, I think, of any NFL quarterback last year. And I, I think they need to put him under center. They brought in a guy like Bateman who, you know, he, he's a, a very good route runner. He can work inside, outside. I, I think they need to rely more on, on the in the passing game. And uh, I think what Eric said earlier, you know, his, his accuracy outside the numbers. You know, when he throws it down the middle, he's very accurate. But when he throws it outside the numbers, he's not. And that, that's, I think, part of that is getting him under center. I think that's going to have a lot to do with things this year. But uh, the accuracy does need to improve. The Ravens are a tough team. And, Eric, you're talking about how – Baltimore talks about, you know, how they're always complaining. I live in New England for the past 20, other than last year, for 20 years, I watched them with unparalleled success. But if you turned on sports radio on Monday mornings, you'd have thought they had been losing, you know, 14 games a year for the past 20 years. Yeah, because they only won by 20 instead of 30, right? Yeah, and it's like, yeah, uh, you know, I, sports radio, after every Patriots Super Bowl win, well, they didn't blow them out. They only won by three. Who the F cares at this point? When you win a Super Bowl, who cares about style points? Just go to know? the parade, man. Just go yeah, to the parade. Yeah, you go, you know, cue the duck boats, okay? <laughs> Oh, so they won by three. They should have won by ten. Who cares? But that's, I mean, it's its its ridiculous up here. Well, it was. I, I live in Florida now, but it was crazy up there. Sports radio, you know, and especially with Brady. I mean, they were always, I mean, we've been hearing the demise of Tom Brady since he was 32, you know. Hey, when I lived in South Florida and Marino hurt that Achilles, and Scott Mitchell came in and ran our record to nine and two. Talk radio was all about trade Marino while he still got some value because <laughs> Scott Mitchell is the future of the franchise. And everybody was sure. And thank God this was before the internet, okay? Because that would have, can you just imagine Twitter now with that dynamic? It just it was very thankful. Um, in hindsight, that nobody could go on Twitter and talk about let's trade Marino and yeah. keep Scott Mitchell. Well, I, you know, I started hearing the first of that's the end of Brady when he tore his ACL, and that was in 2008. That was 13 years ago. You know, people were saying, we're never going to see that Tom Brady again. We're never going to uh, see it. <laughs> yeah, better Tom Brady. Yeah, four I, Super Bowl wins later. Yeah, exactly. Eric, you, know. you just made me sick. <laughs> really <laughs> made me sick. And I'll tell you what, you really make 
Because number one, okay, the Detroit Lions proceeded to sign Scott Mitchell. Yes, I know. <laughs> good enough. And for those of you that want a trivia question about the last guy that won a playoff game in Detroit, how do you spell Eric Kramer? Okay. R I K K R A M E R, I believe. Okay, and I once upon a time met Eric Kramer at Super Bowl 39 in Jacksonville. My goodness, all these cities come up to be what they are. You make me. <laughs> Wayne Fonts drank the Scott Mitchell Kool Aid. Don Shula thought he had Dan Marino's successor, which he thought he did. And he's probably saying, thank God Detroit took him off his hands. Then again, we're talking about the same Detroit Lions who, once upon a time, Don Shula used to be an assistant coach for. And I don't want to tell you how that turned out. Then again, the people in South Florida would like to know how it turned out. Okay, but you make me. <laughs> that's we'll just that's we'll just make that the title of the video. You, you don't even have sick. to go ahead and edit that part out. You make. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should, no, I should point out another thing here about this whole thing about Lamar Jackson. I am not very confident that mobile quarterbacks have a long shelf life. Okay, these guys get absolutely pounded. Cam Newton getting hammered, okay, and all the other quarterbacks that have been mobile quarterbacks got hammered, okay, in year number four or five, they make everybody sick, because then you have to draft another one, okay, yep. so I guarantee these are parts of this broadcast you won't have to edit out, okay, Eric. Okay. Scott, you repaid me the favor, because if you want to talk about running quarterbacks that got injured, Let's not talk about Drew Brees or Dante Culpepper for us Dolphin <laughs> fans, okay? So payback for you. Congratulations. No way, man. You <laughs> make it up, Scott Mitchell. Okay. Uh, are we having a good old time? I love the crew we have here tonight. I'm telling you, this is a phenomenal crew. We got Mr. Fantasy. We got the Fluffy, and then we got uh, Mr. Patriot, and you had me. Well, whatever, okay. <laughs> but uh, but no, the reality is, is this, okay? Scott Mitchell, you make me sick, okay? Am I going to make everybody uh, – you know, we could actually – maybe I wonder if I can do one of those alarms here. We could sell it on eBay. I'm going to have Eric Gerson as my agent about you make me sick and how can we go ahead and make the motor city mad miles version of you make me sick and turn it into an alarm thing I don't know. well what 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 we'll do is you just make that like like for my channel my my thing for hockey is two points right so i have mugs and shirts <laughs> and everything with two points on it so we'll just when you when the then this channel gets big enough and you can monetize and have your own merchandise You'll have mugs and shirts and hats that say, you make me sick. And it'll be a beautiful thing because people will wear it to the mall and they'll be like, what? And, <laughs> I mean, it'll start a conversation. I guarantee oh, I you that. It. You know who I'm hiring as my agent? You just volunteered. Yeah. So, Spaceballs 2, huh? the search for more money. Spaceballs 2, the search for more <laughs> money. It's all about merchandising. Merchandising. Yeah. Merchandising. Yeah. Hey, yep. I can just say this, okay, Mike Greenberg. I don't care who the hell your damn panel is. I'll take my three guys all day long, okay? I got Steve Ballesteri. I got Joe Beckham, and I got Flying Fluffy Eric Gerson, who's the miraculous worker making sure that none of this technology makes me sick, okay? <laughs> but, no, as far as the shelf life of mobile quarterbacks, I'm not overly enamored. RG3 is another classic example of a guy and Cam Newton. Yeah. I wonder about Kyler Murray down the road, all these guys that move around. In the end, they're going to get hammered if they don't play smart. And as Steve Ballesteri has been saying all along, get under center instead of just being yourself wide open for a wide open target. I just don't. Yeah. It just doesn't fly with me. So meanwhile, folks, I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan Roth. The man with the headset is Eric Gerson. Okay, the man with the hair. Okay, a lot of it. The brown stuff is <laughs> Joe Packham. And, of course, my uh, esteemed colleague, Steve Ballesteri. Okay. Ooh, the old guy. You talk about the, <laughs> and the facial hair. Well, I had mine shaved off a little bit last week until it grows a little bit. 
We're having a good old time here on the Sports Exchange. We're really having a lot of fun talking about the quarterbacks and the various places where they change places. And, you know, you know, we have a lot of interesting storylines. You talk about – we all talk about the old soap opera as the world turns, well, as the quarterbacks travel, and we only hit a certain part of the region. We might do this – on another broadcast and talk about other different quarterbacks in other places. But I think the key this time was the focal point when you talk about the Aaron Rodgers and and then Justin Fields, Jared Goff, and Kirk Cousins. I think it's a pretty good group. Then we have two in there, okay, since the Dolphins lost Nick Saban to Alabama. I guess Nick Saban says, well, you don't have to hate me too bad, South Florida. At least I'm sending you a quarterback and now a wide receiver so we can cushion the blow. And we all know that when Nick Saban was there, he had Joey Harrington, another former Lion. Oh, and by the way, he stuck it to us on Thanksgiving, and he said, you make me sick. Okay. (laughs) And, of course, Tom Brady and Trevor Lawrence and Tim Tebow. And, of course, Lamar. Are we covering a lot of interesting bases here tonight on the Sports Exchange? Yep, it was a lot of fun. This was this was this was good. This was good. You know, and and here we are, the Twitter trio, or at least you guys are. Me, I'm just out there, uh, going out there and going ballistically crazy here, trying to figure out uh, one little thing. And before we get off the air tonight, I do have to point out to my esteemed colleagues, okay, and I am going to make a baseball reference to this thing that I actually asked Don Mattingly a question, and that, uh, about the amount of no hitters that were thrown. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I won't mention any names right now, but when that comment went viral on Twitter with another colleague of mine in Miami, it had 392,000 views and my voice was in the background. So it just goes to show you that just because you have a simple question doesn't mean you know how many people are hearing it. And if you actually want to listen to the Don Manningly excerpt, you can go to subscribe to the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel and you'll be able to pick up that as well. So a little bit of a promo for the Don Manningly uh, media availability call that the Miami Marlins had out there. And Don Manningly said that literally in that clip that baseball is unwatchable and yours truly, okay, who's making everybody sick tonight by sounding like a broken record because of Scott Mitchell, Scott Morgan Roth, you make me sick. You know, my Ram, who cares? We're having a good time. What's that difference? But anyways, uh, before we wrap up the broadcast, if you want to go ahead and follow uh, the Sports Exchange as well as our other broadcasts, you can go to www.southflorida.tribune.com. You can follow us at Twitter, at uh, Tribune South, a couple ways to get it. And, of course, we have a lot of different shows out there. Eric uh, Gerson is going to be a part of them. And, of course, Steve has his place always on the Sports Exchange. And Joe Peckham just earned himself another way to get on here. We're going to find the places to incorporate this guy in here because I think your fantasy perspective tonight, Joe, made it interesting how you're able to blend the fantasy world into reality. And when you have a very unique combination as we've had tonight, then I think it certainly makes it people think on a lot of different levels. So any uh, final thoughts from any of the three of you guys before we uh, wrap it up? Like, it was a share, lot of fun. Subscribe. Yes, this was great. This was this this was this was a lot of fun. This was Thanks a lot for of fun. I, I'm, yep. Well, I'm looking for you guys are regular. So when Candy Ebling goes ahead and puts together the uh, lineup card, you, your names are going to be on it for given broadcasts without a doubt. And Eric Gerson, you're going to be on all kinds of different ones. You're going to be on No Limits. You're going to be on the South Florida Trivia Podcast, Sports Exchange. I guess the only one you won't be on will be the baseball show. We have other people that can handle that. But he's got three out of four. Steve Ballesteri is firmly entrenched in the Sports Exchange and on No Limits because we've done some pretty good stuff on No Limits, right, Steve? Talk about veterans, things like that. And Joe, well, what can I tell you, buddy? You're a Sports Exchange. You've earned yourself a spot on the Sports Exchange for sure. So, Meanwhile, on behalf of Eric Gerson, the man with the headset, and <laughs> Joe Packham, the man with the head of hair, okay, the, the uh, dark style, and Steve Ballesteri, the man with the beard, the facial hair, and all the other good stuff. And my name is Scott Morton, <laughs> the local city Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange, and I look forward to bringing you the episode uh, sometime down the road. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us, and we will catch you the next time. Good night, everybody. Night.